who started in painting and kids have looked at neoclassical paintings like David, which, you know, and, and the need for, for, for art to be um, mimetic and recreate and give us the sense of depth in painting. And then we go to the impressionists and they play around with light and, and then the foams and they distort color. And then you move towards uh, the abstract. And, well, we're in abstract expressionists. But, but increasingly, things um, become more removed from an academic structured style. And when we started the year, we started out by saying, what does it mean to be modern? What is modern? I mean, what is modern? And today it's a hard question. It's because I, you know, when you're in the present time, you think, well, everything is modern. But years from now, we may be all walking around with uh, virtual reality glasses and never have to come to a class or, you know, who knows? But um, um, I, one of the critics was saying, all interesting and original art looks ugly at some point. So you want to remember and remind the kids that we think impressionism is so beautiful. Who could, you know, who could object to that? But at the time, they said a wallpaper gives a better impression. So, so as we move through, but but that you know they were scandalized. The subject matter was scandalous. The treatment of the subjects was scandalous. The visible brush marks of the artist putting himself into the artwork was scandalous. Then you have Cezanne who says. I'm not even going to like cover up all the sections of the paint. I'm going to leave some of the canvas peeking through. Why are we fooling anybody? This is a two-dimensional medium, and that's what it is. So artists in the modern period are departing from this idea that we have to trick the eye or fool people. Or I mean, you, they may resort to those things. They have those tools at their disposal, depending on what they're choosing to express. So today we're. We'll talk about Pete Mondrian first, and then I think spend a little more time on Jackson Pollock, just because all the other artists, modern artists say, and de Koenig said it um, most famously, that Jackson Pollock kicked down the door so the rest of us could come in. That, that he had to suffer the slings and arrows of being the first, and for people to scratch their heads and say, I could do that, a two-year-old could do that, and what's great about that, and what's art about that? And, and so we'll back up into that story. But so now, so just remember, like tell kids, you know, when something's new, first we look at it and we think, like, who needs that? Or what is that? Or why is that? Or that original things sometimes take a while to become accepted. And we know that today, virtually anything is acceptable under the guise of art. Even, you know, we even have um, performance art. Most of the work that he did, he did not name. He just, you know, gave it. Opus number two, or study number one, or whatever. But he gave it very, he gave his work very generic name. In this case, it was um, in 1940 that he came to America. He was living in New York, and he was a great. Does anybody know what boogie boogie is? It's a well, it's a kind of jazz music that was sort of you know um, underground, but becoming popular in the 40s at that time. So he was a great fan of jazz music, which is all about improvisation and um, you know um, and experimentation. And that um, originally, you know, he he studied art and he painted a lot of traditional paintings and stuff. But um, he was exposed to other more modern artists and to the Cubists and to the Surrealists, and he began to. Um, write about art, and he formed a society with another artist at the time, Theo van Dosburg, and they developed something called De Stijl, which when written in Dutch is S-T-I-J-L, the style, but it was about neoplasticism and about, and he wanted What's that these, mean, um, the new way of, apply, of applying elements, both in, and not strictly, it's not entirely descriptive in a way that we understand it, um, the plastic arts, um, construction, um, architecture, painting, design. Uh, some people may remember, you're too young to remember, I don't know, do you remember Courage? Remember the Go-Go Girls, the, you know, those dresses that actually had Mondrian, these, these linear designs? Anyway, he and Van Dosburg, um, they had a, um, an artistic journal where they published their ideas, and they had this idea that um, they wanted to reduce art to the point where it couldn't be reduced any further. So what do we see here? What kinds of colors do we see? Primary colors. <coughs> primary colors are the colors from which all other colors derive. <coughs> so these are unadulterated, pure primary colors. 
You can't, you, you know, with pink, you can take out the white and get to red, but with red, you're at rock bottom. With blue, the same thing, but if you mix blue and yellow together, you'll get green. So these are the pure, unadulterated colors. So at this point in his mature style, he'd gotten to the point where he only used straight lines and the shapes that they could yield. He had, uh, part of the theory was that, um, that the uh, lines, the, the vertical lines were male and the horizontal lines were female. But you may say that's so, bi that's so, you know, we've looked at Miro. Last time the kids looked at Miro and those were biomorphic shapes. Now we, we don't know exactly what each one represented, but we, we knew that there was something naturalistic about them, that when we look outside at the things that, that are created in nature, those don't have hard edges. But yet um, Mondrian felt that these are still reflecting nature because there are intersections in nature of the ground and the tree. So, so he is reflecting natural phenomenon, but again, in the most irreducible way. He has distilled things down. It's like, you know, when you're cooking and you put chicken broth into the thing and you cook it and you cook it and you cook it and you reduce all the extraneous and, and the steam leaves and all the water goes out of it and you're left with, with the residue. What's left? So the most elemental parts, and we talk about the elements of art when we talk about art making and how artists employ those elements of art you know, in different ways um, to achieve different effects. And he wanted to reduce, there's almost a spiritual um, component to this art because he was spiritual. He was exposed um, to, aside from Calvinism, but he in his own life was a spiritual person. And he's actually a study in contrast because although he lived in a studio and in a home that looked like this, that was very austere and he didn't care if the chair was comfortable, it was the elemental aspects, everything that he did reflected this philosophy. But they say he was also a very social and gregarious, although very private individual. And uh, not married, but many friends um, shared his ideas. So in this canvas, which comes late in his life where he's come up at, with this this philosophy of reducing art to the basics, he restricted himself to only using pure primary color or black, white, and, and gray, which he referred to as the non-colors. And if you remember the canvas that you saw at the Met, I think it had black um, you know, lines in it. But those were the only colors that he would use in his palette. And then, of course, the resulting shapes that would come from only straight lines. And again, you know, the, the horizontal reflecting you know, um, the, the yin and the yang, the female in, in nature and the, and the male in nature, <coughs> just the way a tree grows out of the earth. Um, <coughs> when, he did, when you paint a painting like this, if you live in Russia or you live in China or you live in America, this is something we all relate to. These are, these are like foundational things. It's, in a way, it's like the Esperanto of painting. It was meant to be universal. These are universal elements in art. And now you're only looking at one canvas of his, but if you look at the book, or if you have other examples that you can pull up for them, you'll see how many variations there are on a theme. It's really <coughs> a, a testament to creativity. If someone says to you, um, you, can, you have to write a story, but you can only use these 10 words. To restrict your, your tools is really you know, quite strenuous for the artist, for him, for, for him or her, to like to constantly reinvent. I think it's amusing that he actually fell out with Theo Van Dosburg. They they broke, you know, with each other because Van Dosburg suddenly decided, you know what, we want I want to use diagonal lines, and Mondrian wouldn't have anything. I mean, he wouldn't do it. He said, no, no, Mon. If you want a diagonal, do it like this. The other thing he did is he didn't frame his paintings. There's no sense of depth. This is flat. Um, you can tell the kids that he did use masking tape to get the straight edge, and he would, yeah, when it, and if, if you go to the MoMA and you see it, you'll be able to see. He did use tape. Lots of artists did that. You know, Barnett Newman also had the zips, those straight lines, but sometimes, but he would remove them and then paint in, but, but Mondrian did use masking tape at this point. It was, it was the straight engineered line, but he would move it around and he would, um, you know, experiment with it, but and not always. So if we look at just this canvas, what, and I tell you that it's called Broadway, which we know is the very busy street in Manhattan, and Boogie Woogie, which relates to music that's syncopated and energetic. 
do you get a sense of that when you look at this painting? Now that there's a title, if I called it Study Number 22, you would bring other things to it. Artists can tweak things very subtly by putting a frame on something, by not putting a frame on something, by um, having something on a pedestal or taking it off a pedestal, by, um, by the colors that they use, by... Now, if we were to fold this canvas in half, even though it's very, you know, geometric and, and it has a lot of straight lines, is it symmetrical? No, it's not. It's, it, it's asymmetrical. You know, there are these, these larger um, compositions of, of rectangles and squares over there, and there are, there are more dispersed ones over here. And so now that we know the kind of the work of Boogie Woogie, what, what do you feel when you see it? What's the relationship? What, what could the colors represent to you? We've all been to New York City. What do you think of? It feels like lights. Like lights? On and yellow taxis? Right, I was thinking traffic. Say it again? I was thinking traffic. Traffic? Absolutely. You know, like if we were going to do a soundtrack to this. Please excuse the interruption. Yona, Michael, and Gilad. Glazer, please go to Robert Krause's office. than the illusionistic, than the fake. Um, uh, 
uh, and that's why he didn't give his works a lot of titles. But this particular work gives us a clue about rhythm and energy and syncopation and activity, which he loved and he did like New York. Um, you know, and I did mention like the access, the the the, y, the, the male and the female access, which he felt does reflect nature. Um, and those are the purest forms. They can't be reduced any further. So I guess I got it there. So I'm just going for balance. We're not really going to do Calder, but I will tell you that. Um, should we talk about Calder just for a minute, just because you've already seen the, the things? Calder actually visited Montaigne's studio in 1930, and it is at that point that he became interested in abstraction and in also reducing his his tools available at his arsenal. Now, in a very different way, because he'd also been in Paris where he created those little circus figures that if you go to the Whitney are finally on, on ex exhibit. Um, seeing Mondrian was very influential, and he, he was taken by the way Mondrian lived in this very austere, um, very elemental way that in, in Mondrian's studio, and I think there are pictures in there, of him, he felt that these principles should be applied to architecture, furniture, other things as well. This is just a housekeeping. We're not really teaching them about Calder, is that correct, or we are? We don't really have it in this, okay. this thing, but we've done it in yes. Well, did you show them the, and, and if you went to the museum, yeah. if you have fifth graders, have if you have mobile. older kids, I'd reference it. I would just say, remember we looked at the mobiles, because it is interesting how they all influence each other. Now, I'll just say about Calder, and I won't dwell there, is that his shapes are obviously not little squares and little rectangles hanging from his, his mobiles, but he had been in Paris when he was doing his, actually he was the first performance artist because he created all those little circus figures and he would do these, these shows for people. And if you go online, you can actually find some fuzzy, scratchy little film clips of him like, blowing into a tube so that the, the clown is holding, or the, the seal is holding up a ball, the ball inflates. I mean, it was really very inventive. And his training was in engineering. But he, is the, he comes from a long line of sculptors, um, and so he was imbued with art. And as a child, he made jewelry for his sister's dolls. He worked at a toy company for a period of time. But he studied engineering at Stevens Institute, so he was pragmatic. Um, and he had many different jobs, but he started to take a night course in drawing and eventually decided that no, he was going to pursue art and then went to the Art Students League. But when he was in Paris, he was friendly with all of the surrealists. And, and this will be relevant when we talk about Jackson Pollock as well. We know that the surrealists were very interested in tapping into the unconscious and, you know, for example, Miro, we know, had those biomorphic shapes that are, that are organic and naturalistic and are sometimes um, sort of a, a hieroglyphic representing something else. And when you look at Calder's work at this time, when he decided after meeting Mondrian that he was going to do something similar, something more restricted, basically he uses his engineering skills to create these, these suspended forms of art that have kinetic components, they move, they move with, and, and originally he made things with motors, but eventually, then ultimately he ended up with the mobiles, and Marcel Duchamp called them mobiles and coined that phrase, but he created things that had those biomorphic shapes, and very often his titles like lobster tail or fish in a trap or something um, give us hints that, that they are, you know, things that are found in the natural world, but then again, he also restricted his canvas. Like when you look at, at Calder mobiles, you don't see pinks and, and yellow, well, an occasional yellow, but again, reducing things down to primary colors. And we're not doing him, but there's an article here about an auction um, in 2012 and about the works that he did, the ones that have more color are more prized, but he too, like Mondrian, began to restrict the colors, but like Miro, who was his friend, his shapes were more biomorphic, and then you have the added element of the engineering feat that it takes. You know, one of the projects I, that I used to do with kids when we would make, we would make a Calder mobile, and you will find that, you know, the thing, it's very hard to achieve that scientific balance that allows the work to move and not to dip or, or go off kilter. So he, he really was sort of, you know, 
a polymath in that way. He brought all of the tools available to him um, to creating this new kind of art. Um, so let's move on to um, Paula. And I think that, did you want to say, no, you want to keep the other question? Uh, no. <laughs> Um, it's funny when we were at the museum, the kids like kids Mommy, wanted to stay Mommy. at the Pollock for a long Mommy. time. Why? His older brothers have come to New York to be artists. He, um, you know, he he wasn't a naturally gifted draftsman. Like, you know, we look at Mondrian and we can see that, you know, like Matisse, like Picasso, they could do anything. So when they did something, it was clearly a choice. Um, Paula came to New York, he was very poor at times, you know, and he kept, struggled with his lack of, um, of natural draftsmanship. And he studied at the Art Students League and he studied under Robert Hart Benton. And I don't know if anybody went into those interior rooms at the Met, but Robert Hart Benton was a, an American regionalist painter who painted, um, you know, scenes of Ameri American life of farmers in the fields or, you know, of, and, and his forms are very um, rhythmic, they're not, um, they're not ultra realist. They have a certain, there's a lot of curved line and, and emotional um, investment, but they're figurative. Jackson Pollock broke the door down, you know, for future abstract and other modern painters, you know, to eliminate the figurative from art completely. But actually, that's sort of false. I mean, I, I unfortunately thought I had the other book, but I must have been like looking at it and left it on the table. Um, his art also, um, when he studied under Robert Hart Benton, Robert Hart Benton felt something for him because although he wasn't the mo you know the most technically adept, he was clearly the most invested in art, and he knew that some sort of art would emerge from him. And one wonders what he would have made of the art that emerged from him. But again, going back to that notion that all original art is considered ugly or bizarre at first, so Jackson Pollock certainly gratified that you know fulfilled that requirement but his his work in the beginning is somewhat figurative he was obsessed and like van gogh he was one of these people who knew about other artists and and thought about them and um i mean i'm i'm digressing but i went to a uja thing yesterday there was a professor from yale who talked about jews in cinema and he showed us uh, something from, I can't remember if it was a Woody Allen movie or something, but it, 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 it's literally lifted from uh, a German expressionist film. And artists know when they're incorporating or paying homage to people that come for him. And he, in the beginning when he was still doing more figurative work, it was very much inspired by both Picasso and believe it or not by Matisse because he did use color uh, more outrageously. But then he, I guess he felt that, it, you know, there, they say there are lots of different elements that influenced him. He was aware of Native American drip painting, where they would paint by dripping sand, you know, and then Diane used to tell the story that he and his brothers, the five brothers, he was the youngest, used to pee in the sand when they lived in Wyoming, and that was his first artistic influence. You don't have to share that story, but, you know, and he was apparently quite the macho man. Um, anyway, uh, so he knew a lot and he had this restless burning desire to create art and to influence art and eventually he did happen upon this medium which are called the drip paintings and the overall paintings now there have been paintings beforehand that have drips in them you know and the artist allows you to see that oh a drip occurred but there hadn't been a painting that was entirely comprised of the action of painting. And so it's Jackson Pollock famously translated painting from the what to the how. And his champion um, amongst the critics was Clement Greenberg, um, who was, you know, just in love with, besotted with, with Jackson Pollock. And there's a famous, um, I think it was a Look Magazine article that, you know, did an article called Jack the Dripper, is he the greatest uh, living American artist? And it's sort of tongue in cheek because at that point the jury was out. But there were those who saw that what he was doing was truly revolutionary and breaking new ground. And you know, you can tell the kids 
A brush never touches his canvas in these paintings. Some of the paintings, like the one we saw, had some open canvas left on it. That's the one at the Met has, it's yeah. not completely covered. This painting is covered. And he also enlarged the scale of these paintings so that they were monumental. Not every work he did was, but the idea that he didn't prime his canvases and suspend, and, you know, paint off of a, an easel or, or hang them, but rather became immersed in the practice itself. And I've never seen the movie um, with Ed Harris where he plays Pollock, oh but they say it's, you know, the way he was relentless and, and how much physical strength and, and uh, stamina it took. And, and I did read an interview by someone who went to visit him and he showed him a painting he was working on and he said, oh, is it done? He said, no. And the guy watched him for the next 45 minutes run around the canvas and that there were also the elements of serendipity. Sometimes there's a piece of glass, sometimes there's sand or a cigarette butt that sort of gets caught in there and we'll see with, Jack, with Jasper Johns and his encaustics with the flags next year, how that plays out also, you know, that the random happenstance can, can be incorporated into it, but that he had a goal and an intention. And if you remember the, the canvas we saw on the lower level of Jackson Pollock's, if you took the kids into that other room, there were sort of biomorphic forms there. It looked like there was a figure here, a figure here, and then maybe one lying on the ground. In some of his paintings, he actually would have figures that he would completely cover. And, and so that's something that we don't know, but it was part of his process at times. Um, we also know that um, other artists, like de Koenig in particular, you know, thank him for, for liberating the line. So when we talk about the elements of art and we talk about um, Jackson Pollock, it's line that, that's paramount, you know, the, the swirling, energetic, you know, and again, here you had a very rigid, um, geometric, restricted use of line, and here you have an overall liberated kinetic, you know, and when you think about how this came to be, we can only, I mean, it wasn't someone, the brush never touches the canvas, and in fact, he rarely used a brush. Sometimes he'd use brushes that were dried and hard and flick, and he developed, and Lee Krasner, who was his wife, who was also an abstract expressionist, and if you saw the small canvas across, you know, painted in a similar idiom, and, and famously remarked, I had everything going against me. I was a woman, I was Jewish, and I was married to Jackson Pollock. Um, she said that he had a vocabulary. He would use a turkey baster for certain types of splotches. He would use um, sticks. He would use, um, oh, and, you know, any sort of like, um, found straw, any sort of found implement to apply these different types of lines, and, and it's all line. And you know, if we think back to Angle, who said to Degas, line is everything. But when we think about how Angle used line, and then we think about how Degas used line, and Degas became much more naturalistic than Angle, and then we come to this use of line, and we can see that you know we've really gone a long way. And we go even further now. I mean, there are people that are doing things that are even, you know, more out of the box. Um, but it's all thanks to Jackson Pollock, who created what's called gesture or action painting. Um, he was also um, influenced by by the surrealists, you know, and and it's like um, Miro, who was poor and hungry, as was Jackson Pollock, and sometimes in those states of of deprivation, um, they would tap into the unconscious, and the surrealists were fond of that automatic um, impulse where you don't overthink. And as Moreau said, I, I put a line and then I let it lead me. And um, Pollock was troubled by many things in his life and was in therapy. He was also an alcoholic, which tragically ended his life um, in a car accident. Um, but he was in touch with um, you know, Jungian therapy and a lot of um, the theories that surrealists also used when they when they made their work. So, so there's so so what seems to be so simple and straightforward, and I could do that. Well, yeah, try. First of all, again, you have to each of his canvases, and when you see them, you it's true. When you look at a poster, you think like, duh. But when you go and you see the um, the what's the element of art? Texture, the texture, you know, like sometimes, because he used 
uh, aluminum paint, and auto paint. You know, he would use various types of paint that, that some would be shiny, some would be, you know, very dry, some would soak, like he often started with black that he would let soak into the canvas. He also didn't wait for the, can the paint to dry, which then has another effect about how it blends. So, so there was, again, just as Calder had science in his engineering feats of, of creating those mobiles, while this wasn't science that he studied in school, or maybe it was something that he knew about because, you know, he was that kind of a guy, there is something specific to the work that he's doing and knowing why he wanted to use the shiny paint and the thick paint and the turkey baster and the blotches. And if he wasn't happy, he would, you know, leave things out and he would leave things in. I think um, there are a number of his canvases where we see his handprint. And he left that in there because I think he wanted to put himself into the art and he wanted us to know that he didn't stand at an easel and paint like this. He had huge canvases on the floor and he would enter the work and he would circle around the work and he would come at it from different angles. So this is um, the how is equivalent to the what. And the energy and the gesture, gestural painting is, is um, created by virtue of Jackson Pollock being the first to do it. And then, you know, if you look at art that we see in the museum hanging right next to his, we'll see these black images by uh, Franz Klein or, 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 or Motherwell or something, and, and they're mysterious to us. It's poetry of sorts, but, but it, was, it was able to be looked at and considered and taken seriously because of Jackson Pollock. And he did have to endure that Jack the Dripper kind of stuff for a while. And then, you know, he was obsessed towards the end about what would he do next. And apparently, you know, he did have that trouble bending that I'm not going to dwell on and we'll move on from there. Um, was he accepted towards the end? I mean, yes. I mean, you know, he was accepted amongst the avant-garde. I don't think that your grandmother went to the museum and said, oh, Maisha, we have to get one of these, you know? But it's like anything. It's like the people who want to look at the Impressionists and, and, and jeered at them and thought, oh, you know? But, but he did have his own show, Peggy Goo. What's very interesting, and I should make this connection, is that the jury was out uh, about him, even amongst the avant-garde, and it was Mondrian who was on a panel when the, when the Museum of Modern Art was considering whether or not to buy his work, and he said, we must, you must, and you know, and others, you know, the avant-garde artists got it, you know, de Kooning got it, other, his peers totally appreciated what he did, and, and as such, then the tastemakers, like Peggy Guggenheim, you know, began to champion him and take his work. Did he become a household name? Did everyone want to have one? No, but, but he got the attention of being on the cover of Life or Look magazine and people were aware of him. And it's, it's the same as like when Warhol started doing his thing and people were like, that's silk screening, that's from the newspaper or what is, you know, it's, there becomes this consciousness of what's happening at the periphery out in the, in the vanguard. And um, so he had, he had acceptance of his peers. He wasn't necessarily getting rich, but some people were, were wise enough to appreciate what he was doing. Um, can I talk about the project for a few minutes? No. On the I have one second comment. A lot of people may have already seen the picture because it's in the book Olivia by E, and I can't remember his name. It's about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The pig, yeah. So they've seen it before. Like, if you have that book, or if you are in the library. Yeah. Olivia the pig, I forget his name. Uh, he, he, my niece is Olivia. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, it's true. I mean, kids, chances are kids have seen something like it. I can do that about five times. See what I put on again today, but it's very well. So this is, this is, if you were here for the last go around of this, it's the same, it's the same project that Jane had put, had put together way back when also, and it's just a wonderful way to let the kids experience what, what it's like to be Pollock, um, and it's not so easy, right? Um, for all those, those reasons. So we will have in the boxes, paints, paper, and um, popsicle sticks for the kids to drip, and newspapers also, especially I know for the, for people who are in the art room and your period is short, again, the kids are gonna love this and it's remind them it's not a studio art class, you're just you're trying your hands at it. Um, you don't have to 
some kids are going to do it in two seconds, and other kids are going to want to work it. And also tell them that they're not in a studio by themselves where they can fling the art, <laughs> the, the, the paint. They have to like consider. Right, but they'll get they'll get some some of the experience from it, and don't paint your friends or anything like that. Um, so um, hopefully, it should just be a really fun experience. I also, and we can email around the link. I'm sure there are many um, videos of Pollock doing this. Or at um, least of Ed Harris doing this. And, or, so, or Ed Harris, which is essentially the same. So um, I think it's, especially like every classroom has a smart board these days, I think it's really a great tool to yes. like, show them what it was like for him to be standing on the on the ladder again. Uh, and, I, and also that sometimes he would leave parts of the canvas fair, sometimes he would fill it completely, you know, like that there's definitely, you know. Okay. Yeah, and then, um, and then just a general comment about the project as we're wrapping up that we will have again the, um, the like plastic folder file. I'm losing the word. Portfolio. Thank you. Um, for you to slip the things in, and Melissa will send around a cover sheet that kind of like nicely explains. So we don't just want to send it home without explanation. So that parents see the kind of the works that we studied, a brief description of the project, so that they can kind of see how their kid interpreted what it all was. It's not just going home in a vacuum. Um, so just hold on to those. You don't have to. Don't feel like you have to give them at the last class. Like you can get them to them some other other way. And we'll have those portfolios available. I'm guessing in the in the closet in the multi-purpose room. We'll the email sleeves, around like the, the sleeves. sleeves. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the multi-purpose room is full of the mosaic right now, so things are a little bit in flux. We'll, it's, we'll tell you exactly where we can all have them that's accessible to everyone. So um, the art teacher the collective It has to be modern. This is not, you know, uh, you know, the academic, strictly controlled, rigid rules of the art that we looked at in other years in the past. But, um, but this year we're looking at modern art. And it's, in this class, we're looking at abstraction where the elements of art are more important than the actual subject matter. And as Clement Greenberg said, abstract art departs from the mainstream and opens up limitless possibilities. And that's the truth. You have Montaigne with his, his um, distilled rigidity and, and, and refining things down to a point where they can't go any further. And the possibilities are still infinite. When you look at that book and you think like, how many different things can you do with just a straight line and pure color? Um, and then, you know, Hans Hoffman was a teacher who taught at Black Mountain College, a German artist that was revered amongst modern artists, and he said, um, purity of color relationships, but more importantly, making the medium visible. What are the dynamics of the artist's picture making? So in the case of Montmian, there's a, a strictness, an austerity, a purity. In the case of, of Pollock, there's a, an energy and a... Um, and an almost um, un uncontrollable, you know, wildness in, in what he did. But it wasn't just totally random and happenstance. It wasn't an accident. And some, and uh, I think what Benton may have said when he when he was teaching Pollock that he recognized this impulse in him, but that his greatest difficulty would be coming up with his subject. Well, since he was so consumed with art making, it turns out that his subject was actually the making, not the subject. Although, as we know, he has painted figurative things that, you know, become less figurative as they did in the case of Mondrian, as they did in the case of so many people. Um, and uh, modern art, again, is art that does not conform to the past. Um, it, it goes beyond the pale, it goes into the great unknown. Um, you know, and then again, like, you know, they, there's still a relationship between what we looked at last time and the connection to the subconscious and the internal and the emotional life of the artist and the, the um, automatic um, approach to beginning a canvas and then seeing where it leads you, um, which was very much the case with Jackson Pollock. But do you have any other questions? Another really cool thing about them actually getting to try this that also sort of answers that question or you know, comments.